Hello, and welcome to the Life of a Crafty Textile Lady channel. I'm Hillary, and thank you for joining me today on another part of my adventure to build a vintage-inspired wardrobe. That's Heaven the Quaker Parrot. She'll join us as she sees fit, right? Yeah, whenever you the mood strikes you. Yes. So today it is a rainy slash misty slash maybe a little bit of snow. Bye. Yeah, so it's rainy, it's gross today here in Southern Ontario. So it seems like the perfect weather to talk about knitwear. And specifically, I'm going to review the book Saltwater Mittens by Christine Legros and Shirley A. Scott. As part of this review, I'm going to knit two patterns. So let's have a look inside, shall we? For my first book review on this channel, I wanted to do a little bit of CanCon from my home country, which is short for Canadian content if you are not Canadian. But before we dive into the book, I want to talk a little bit about Newfoundland, because in order to understand the beautiful mittens that you find in this book, you need to know a little bit about where they came from. Newfoundland is an island on the Atlantic Ocean on the eastern side of the very large and beautiful country that is Canada. It makes up part of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. It is the first known part of Canada to be inhabited by the settler population, aka white European descendant people like me. What has brought people primarily to Newfoundland is the abundant natural resources, particularly the deep stocks of fish and other sea life to be harvested for consumption. The natural isolation of living on an island means a culture has developed in Newfoundland unlike anything else that can be found in Canada. And the settler population is primarily descendant from Britain and Ireland, although people from all over Europe came at some point for fishing. So some, some fun facts. Um, Newfoundland and Labrador were British colonies until 1949 and the island has its own time zone, which is half an hour ahead of Atlantic Standard Time. Hillary of the future here. Um, my delivery on that was really rough. For whatever reason, I could not remember those lines for the life of me. Um, so just I, bear, bear with me while I'm learning how to do this video thing. Okay, let's go to the next section. Island life on the ocean has resulted in weather with a capital W, including strong winds, heavy cloud, rain, and lots of snow. According to the website for the St. John's Tourism Board, which is the provincial capital, that city receives 322 centimeters, or roughly 10 and a half feet, of snow every year. So if you have just heard that fact and have promptly hidden under a blanket, or crawled under your couch and you can't fathom why anyone would ever want to go someplace that receives that much snow. Fear not because it's actually a really gorgeous and lovely place to visit. There's national parks, historic places, beautiful beautiful natural natural landscapes um, and, and interesting people and places to visit. I was actually supposed to go on vacation to Newfoundland last summer but like all things in time of plague, that trip had to be canceled. So 
let's have a look at the book, shall we? Lest you think this video is just a spot for some free tourism. Now we've established that it's an island where a unique culture has flourished and a place with serious weather, it begins to make sense why a distinct style of mittens can be found there. The patterns have their origins in the British Isles, as well as in Scandinavia and the Balkans, but developed into unique motifs over time. The cost of shipping yarn to a colonial island made using hand-spun wool more economical, and many mittens are made in heavier weight yarn. Fast forward to modern times, and like many places, outside influence and a culture of people buying things instead of making them have caused these unique mittens to become less prevalent on the island. The authors Christine Legros and Shirley A. Scott have been collecting vintage mittens in Newfoundland for the last 40 years and have done what they can to keep the tradition alive. A small bit of their fabulous collection can be found in photos throughout the book in addition to the pieces they've written patterns for. There are three main styles of hand coverings that can be found in saltwater mittens. The first are gloves that cover the hand and have each finger covered separately. There are mittens that have a separate thumb and then cover the rest of the fingers together. And there is a hybrid style, frequently called trigger mittens, which as far as I'm aware are unique to the region. And um, what they have is a separate thumb and index finger and then cover the remaining fingers together. And the name alludes to being able to fire a hunting rifle while still wearing your mittens. But as the authors of the book point out, you can do so much more while wearing these things than firing a gun. Having that separate index finger makes a lot of stuff that's really awkward if you're wearing normal mittens so much easier. Stuff like finding your keys to unlock your front door or driving or shoveling snow. All kinds of good stuff that's good to keep your hands covered in the winter. So let's have a look at what makes Newfoundland mittens so special. So I happen to have access to a pair of authentic trigger mittens, much beloved by my father. They are his favorite for shoveling snow. Even if the winter weather we get here in Southern Ontario is nothing compared to what Newfoundland receives. I'm in possession of these so I can wash and darn them, and as I'm sure you can see, they have been well loved. They have a ribbed cuff with some form of striping. The remainder of the mitten is knit with two-stranded color work. The main area of the hand has a typical geometric design. The fingers and palm are knit in a salt and pepper design, which is also found in most of the patterns in the book. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Heaven's decided to join us again. So throughout the book, the authors recommend different weights of Briggs and Little yarn for their for the projects. And it Briggs and Little, do you know that yarn, Heaven? You do? Okay, well, let's explain to the people in case they don't know. So it's a woolly wool style yarn, fairly unprocessed, spun in New Brunswick, which is also located in Canada's Atlantic region. Right? Maybe you don't know about it. Okay. So it's a fairly inexpensive yarn to find here, but it's actually quite difficult to source if you're outside Canada. And I recently finished a pair of mittens in their sport weight yarn. So I thought it might be helpful for me to show those to you in case you're looking to substitute. So to be clear, these mittens have nothing to do with Newfoundland or the Saltwater Mittens book. These are the Sea Life Mittens MCAL by Erica Mount. This was a mystery knit along hosted on Ravelry that the author put out in September of 2019. The footage I'm showing you is pre-blocking, and while the pattern was written for fingering weight yarn, I knit it with sport weight 
to create super dense, wind-resistant mittens because I'm always cold in the winter. Like, seriously, I'm, I'm just, I'm cold for months. Here's one of the yarn ends to give you an idea of what the yarn looks like. It's a lightly spun yarn and has been lightly processed, so you do find odd bits of vegetable matter as you knit. As it's a machine-made yarn, the thickness is consistent throughout, and the colors are slightly heathered without looking variegated. And as is with most color work in woolly wool, even consistent tensioning will give you some lumps and bumps in your motif, which is really hard to show as it flattens out on camera, but I've done my best to give you a sense of it in this footage. If you're substituting yarn, look for something with similar characteristics. I'm making Dad a new pair of trigger mittens from Saltwater Mittens using the Hangashore pattern. For this project, I'm using Gilead by Der Returum Natura. This worsted weight yarn uses merino yarn from France and Portugal. Normally, merino yarn equals soft yarn, but not all merinos are the same. This is a non-superwash, partially woolen spun yarn, so it has very different properties compared to the superwash merino wool that is currently the darling of the knitting world. A woolen or partially woolen spun yarn help traps air between the fibers, which creates a warm mitten, which is what you're looking for in a good trigger mitt. The Hangashore pattern is written for two colors, one light and one dark, which allows the color work to pop. My light yarn is this light gray colorway Brule Yard, and the dark is this deep red colorway Dragon. This yarn is also subtly heathered, particularly the gray yarn, so it has a similar look compared to the Briggs & Little yarn recommended in the book. If you're looking to substitute, pick a minimally processed yarn that's a solid color or is slightly heathered. It will help your color work look its best, provide a high contrast so you can see all that work you've put into your knitting, and produce a warm mitten or glove.
You good, my dear? Oh, you look sleepy. Yeah? You look sleepy, baby. Here are my finished mittens. What we are currently looking at are my mittens before blocking, and as you may see, my knitwear doesn't look perfect. Stranded color work, as well as working with a more rustic yarn, often results in a slightly uneven surface to your knitwear. So if your project doesn't fall off the needles looking perfect, that's to be expected. The one area I deviate from the pattern instructions is the finishing. The authors suggest steam blocking your piece, but I'm a big fan of wet blocking, so that's what I'm going to do. Whichever technique you use, don't you dare think of skipping blocking. Your finished item will look so much better afterwards, evening up your stitches and smoothing out any unevenness in the surface. You may also notice the yarn tails hanging off my mittens. I weave in my ends after my knitting is complete, but I don't cut them until after blocking. I found that with this technique, my ends stay put in the finished project much more. So I block my knitting projects by giving them a bath in slightly warm soapy water. I'm using a soak product, but I've also used unscented dish soap in the past and had great results with that too. Lightly agitate your knitwear to get all of the water into your mitts, but don't be too rough or you could begin to fill your project. I also tend to drag my knitting around with me wherever I go, which obviously isn't very far in early 2021 for obvious reasons, and it's not unheard of a yarn ball going under my couch or rolling around on my balcony while I work, so giving it a bath will also clean out whatever dirt you've picked up while you were knitting. After letting it soak for a very unscientific amount of time, usually when I remember that I have stuff soaking, I change out the water to cool, clean water and let the soap wash out. Sometimes it takes a few rounds of clean water to remove all the bubbles, which is important as sticky soap residue attracts dirt. Once my mittens have had their bath, I lay them flat on a towel, pushing and pulling them to be roughly the size I want the item to be when it's dry. Once I'm satisfied, I tightly roll up the towel to squeeze out the majority of the water. I've found kneeling on them helps get out even more water, and it also feels very satisfying. You can also step on it with bare feet for similar results.
you can see how wet the towel is after blocking, and I've had a little bit of dye discharge as well, which isn't uncommon the first time you wash a knitted item. Once the water has been squeezed out, lay your mitten out on a new dry towel or a blocking mat. I like to dry my projects near my balcony door, so I need to use a foam mat so I don't get the floor damp, but blocking mats aren't necessary, so if you don't have one, a dry towel works great. Pull out your mittens to shape and leave them to dry. I usually find that they'll be dry in about 24 hours, but that time depends a lot on how dry or humid the environment is, so your results may vary. For colorwork mittens, I often find that they need to be turned inside out partway through the drying process because you have two layers of yarn to dry. So here's my finished project. I'm thrilled with the result. The pattern was easy to follow and made it clear what instructions are for the right and left mittens. The charts and instructions also differentiated the two yarns as dark color and light color instead of using the colors in the sample in the book. I often find instructions written as the latter, and it can be very confusing if you're using different colors than the sample, so this writing style makes it more approachable, in my opinion. I made one small change to the pattern, adding this stripe of the dark color along the edge of each mitten body. It's a detail I found in other mitten patterns I've made in the past to cleanly break up the pattern on the back of the hand and the palm. It also creates this neat stripe along the edge of the thumb gusset, which I really like. I stopped it once the salt and pepper pattern transitioned here. I enjoyed the process of making these trigger mittens and can't wait to make a pair for myself. So at the beginning of the video, I said that I would make two patterns out of this book and we've only talked about one. So here's the second one. I knit baby mittens! These are so cute. I just, I want to knit piles of these. They're just, they're so fun. Right? Are they cute? Yeah, they're not birdie size though. We don't have birdie size mittens. I don't even know where I would put mittens on you if I made you some. Right? Okay. So I made these out of some leftover Erin Wade acrylic, acrylic yarn that I had in my stash. And these are great stash busting projects. Also, they're even easier to make than regular mittens because you don't even have a thumb to worry about. So yeah, so they're a great beginner project, right, Heaven? Yeah, if you're intimidated about the other projects in the book. Yes. Yes, they'd be very good to start off with. Mm -hmm. So um, they're also fairly quick to make. So if you too are finding that your friends and family are procreating at an alarming rate right now and you need lots of baby gifts immediately, I would highly recommend these, right? Okay. Okay. So in summary, Saltwater Mittens is a lovely book about the history of mittens from Newfoundland and the patterns are clear and easy to follow. Most of the projects are knit in double knit and worsted weight yarn, so they're actually pretty quick to complete, especially compared to knitting mittens in a finer gauge like those Sea Life mittens I showed you earlier in the video. Yeah? I wouldn't recommend them for absolute beginner knitters, but if you're a newish knitter looking to build your skills, the projects in this in, included in this book allow you to learn how to knit in the round, uh, perform basic increases and decreases, and two color stranded color work. Plus it's a lot easier to fit, um, to do fit for a hand than say a sweater on an adult body. So thank you for joining us on this review of Saltwater Mittens by Christine Legro and Shirley A. Scott. I hope this video has inspired you to try some colorwork mittens of your own, or even just explore regional knitting styles in your own country. I post videos as soon as basically I finish my projects and 
this little monkey will give me some spare time to edit, right? Yeah, it's very hard to edit and do voiceovers and stuff while I'm giving you head rubs, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so if you want to keep up with me, please press that subscribe button. If you've enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. And in the comments below, maybe let me know your favorite pair of mittens you've ever had. Did you wear them down until they were full of holes and completely useless? Or were they, they sadly a victim swallowed up by a snowbank somewhere never to be seen again? Yeah? You don't wear mittens, so you, you can't really comment. But I, I can't imagine what you trying to fill things in the comment section would look like. It would just be a lot of random letters that you've walked on. So that maybe not so good, huh? Until next time. Bye. And now your moment of parrot nonsense. It's baby mittens. These are so stinking cute. I just want to knit piles of them. So I made these out of leftover Erin weight yarn from my stash. And the yarn is acrylic because that's what I had. And babies and new parents just need stuff that you can throw in the wash. Evan has also decided she's excited about baby mittens and would like to come and participate in this part of the video. Right? So baby mittens are even easier than normal mittens because there's no thumb. And they're pretty small and quick. You've totally distracted me. You know that? You always distract me. Shall we start with you together? Okay. Yes? Mm-hmm. Okay. I thought if I gave you millet, you would leave me alone. That that didn't work? You just got millet out of it? And, you, and Mama still has to deal with a parrot? Yeah, you're smarter than me, huh? You definitely are. Okay, so, so can I start this segment? Okay. You're gonna participate? Okay, good job.